Jesus and love unto all the saints, I cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of His calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of His power to usward, who believe according to the working of His mighty power, which He wrought in Christ when He raised Him from the dead, set Him at His own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principalities and powers, and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And has put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Amen. Father, we love you and thank you for your word. Ask for your blessings tonight. Keep your hand upon us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. In this letter that Paul's writing, I'm just going to teach on this lesson tonight. Paul's writing to the uh, church at Ephesus, and he's telling them uh, the foundation of everything that he was going to be sharing in that letter was their faith. And he said, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and to love unto all the saints, they say that the book of Ephesians is the most spiritual letter that Paul ever wrote. That there's more in that letter. It's, it's a, uh, a problem-free letter, actually, when you, when you read it. It's not like Corinthians. When you read Corinthians, you're reading all kinds of problems in the book of Corinthians. I mean, that was a mess. Uh, their church was a, uh, a carnal church. It had... Uh, um, you know, division in it. One one guy was saying, "I'm Apollos. I'm a, I'm a uh, Cephas. I'm, I'm a, one even said, well, 'Well, I'm a Christ.'" Mm -hmm. And uh, so they had such division, arguing about which one of the preachers they liked the best. And then in the book in the church of Corinth, there was a man that was, uh, you know, having an affair with his mother-in-law. And all kinds of junk going on in the book. But yet in the book, the first chapter of Corinthians, Paul called them saints. And that's always been a mystery to me. Why, uh, you know, it, he's just saying that the Corinthian church was a carnal. But when you get to the book of Ephesians, these people are out in the heavenlies. They're, they're a different type of people. Um, you know, they're more spiritual. And he's able to share with them uh, greater spiritual truth because that they were more spiritual people. He says that the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know. That is one of the things uh, that I want to talk about for a few minutes tonight is, is the eyes of our understanding being enlightened. You know, uh, years and years and years of being a Christian uh, it teaches you that, you know, when you think you know a lot, you know nothing. Mm -hmm. You really do. I mean, you may think, you know, uh, after years of, of walking with the Lord, now you know a lot of things, but but really when you get right down to it, we don't know half as much as we think we know. <laughs> and, uh, you know, it's, it's just that way. Um he that thinks he knows much knows nothing, I guess, you know. But we know a little. Paul says the reason that is is because that our understanding can be darkened and we don't see what God wants us to see. And he's saying, what is the hope of your calling and what the riches of the glory of His inheritance in the saints, have you ever thought about, you know, we're, we're usually thinking in terms of, of what God is to us, you know, uh, that, that's the way we view being a Christian. 
what God is to you and I. And that's true. He's our creator. He's our, But have you ever thought about what you mean to God? What, what we mean to Him? And what the riches of His inheritance in the saints? And so uh, God didn't call us just to save us. Or, or there has to be a greater purpose in God's calling you and I than just to save us. And in Romans 8 and 28, I think it's a key scripture that gives us a little bit of insight into that, that what I just said. Romans 8 and 28 says that, Now we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Yep, amen. How, how many can quote that scripture? Amen. Every, just about everybody can quote that. To them who are the called according to this purpose. Now that word purpose up there, if you go to the original language that the Bible was written in, or translated into, you'd find that that word purpose is, is a, a term that was pulled out of the Old Testament economy where the showbread in the temple of God was placed on a table in the tabernacle and it was what's called a putting forth of the showbread uncovered to where the priests when they would walk in they could see this showbread and so God is saying that we are called according to his purpose in other words God's inheritance in the saints is a putting forth of his saints to be trophies of the grace of his, uh, of the power and of his grace. In other words, every one of us, every one of us that are saved tonight, God is putting you and I on display. And whether we like to admit it or not, when we are out there in the public, we are on display. Amen. And we say we're Christians, people watch us. Yes. And you know, they they watch Christians. And so that word purpose means more than just what we think in the English. It means that God has a purpose for your life and that purpose is that He wants to show you and me off. He wants to show what His grace can do in a life. How His grace can change a person's life. Oh, I'm telling you. I used to be such a scoundrel. When I was 26 years old, 25 and 26, I, you know, I just was out doing my own thing, but God said, I'm going to change you. And I'm going to change you from the inside out. And so when He brought that change into our lives, He began to change us and put His grace on display in our life and, and show people that, you know, that greater is He that's what? In us. In you than He that is in the world. Amen. Now this is the hope of glory. The Bible says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And it's, that's where Christ dwells right now. He dwells in our heart and in our life. Everyone that is called of God is His trophy. Paul told Timothy to meditate upon the doctrine of God, to give himself wholly unto it, that the prophet, his profiting may appear unto all. And in other words, what he's telling Timothy, he says, Timothy, I want you to study the Word of God. I want you to give yourself to meditating upon the Word of God. Do you know what that word meditate means? To ponder, to look at it. Just don't read it like a newspaper. It, you know, like the word purpose I said there. That, that word's got a lot of meaning to it other than just the word that we understand. And so when we meditate upon the Word of God, God is able to, to begin to reveal to our understanding and reveal to the, uh, and open our eyes that we're able to see that what He's doing in the church is much more than what the carnal man can comprehend all by himself. You see, you, you and I, we can't comprehend what God is doing. God's Word and 
And what God is doing is understood only through the words that the Spirit of God gives to the church. Amen. You see, the, uh, the deep things of God are revealed with words that the Holy Spirit gives to the church. You see, and our understanding has to be enlightened. David said, Blessed is the man that meditates on the law of God, and he shall be like a tree that's planted. In other words, God is saying there that if you meditate upon the Word of God and you give yourself to ponder the Word of God, then God's going to put things in there in your heart and in your mind that's going to give you stability to be able to stand when the evil times come. And it's hard to do if, if, if we're not in tune with God's Word and letting God's Word you know, saturate our heart and life. God told Joshua to meditate upon the law of God and he would prosper. Joshua's getting ready to go into the land of Canaan and before he was ever allowed to go into that land, God stopped him. He said, I want you to do this. I want you to take the word of God, the, the law of Moses, and I want you to ponder and meditate upon that word day and night. Don't be separated from it then you will have good success. How many knows that pondering and meditating upon the Word of God is the way to be successful? It, it, in other words, it gives us the ability to walk in the Spirit of God. You see, walking in the Spirit is not walking around with eyes real glazy <laughs> or smoke coming out of your ears. Walking in the Spirit is simply walking by the Word of God. Amen. Yeah. That's the best definition for walking in the Spirit. Man. I've seen a lot of people, you know, they get that glazy look in their eyes, you know, and, uh, and they think they're more spiritual than anybody else. But, uh, you know, it, it's how we walk with God that makes us spiritual. If we're a spiritual person, we're going to be people of the Word of God. Book of Ephesians, we are taught three great truths that I just want to mention real quickly. I'm not going to hold you long. Three great truths which demands that the eyes of our understanding be enlightened. You see, when you read this book of Ephesians, you're reading one of the most spiritual books in the Bible. This is at the top of the line spiritual books. And when you're reading that, he tells us in that book, of our great position that we have. He said when Christ was seated in heavenly places and He has caused you and I to be seated together with Him in heavenly places. Now how does that happen? How does your mind grasp that truth? Amen. When the Bible says that we are seated with Him in the heavenlies, how does that happen? Because in the Spirit, in God's economy, and the way God sees you and I, He reckons to you and I the things that you and I can't see but are actually true. We are seated with Him in heavenly places even though we're right here. But God sees us as already in heaven. What's that scripture that says God calls those things which are not? Huh? As though they are. So he tells you and I, the Christian church, the body of Christ. You see, the Bible says he is the head of the body, which is what? The church. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we are his body and he is the head of the body, then that means if the head of the body is in heaven, either we've got a, uh, he's got a neck that is billions of miles long, or we're in heaven with him and his reckoning. So you see what the Apostle Paul is telling you and I? The eyes of our understanding have to be enlightened that we may see what God's inheritance is in the saints. We are with Him in heaven. Then He goes on to teach us 
that not only are we seated in heavenly place, but we also are to walk worthy of the calling which He has given us. That word walk is mentioned time and time again. We are to walk worthy. We are to walk as believers. We walk in, not in the vanity of our mind. We are to walk in love. We are to walk in, in uh, Christian life. We are to walk circumspectly, not as fools, redeeming the time because the days are evil. And so he says also in chapter 6, we are to stand against the wiles of the devil. Put on the whole armor of God, he said, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now I want to give you just a couple instances in the Bible where this, this will be made plain to you. The Bible says in the book of John, John 3, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever what believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. When you go to the Old Testament and you read that story, you find the story of how the children of Israel have rebelled against God. And so God sent into the camp these fiery serpents, these poisonous serpents that would bite the people and they were dying. So, you know, they didn't call, you know, to find a remedy for, you know, the snake bite. And they didn't try to invent an anointment, but God gave them the remedy for those snake bites. Now he told Moses, here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a brass serpent, fasten it, put it on a pole, and hold it up where everyone can see it. Now, if you and I had been there in the wilderness when that was done, we would have had a thousand questions in our minds. What is a serpent on a pole going to do us any good? Number one, the serpent was made of brass. Brass speaks of judgment. God told those disobedient people in this day that I will make the heavens over top of you as brass. Brass is a type of judgment. Then, the serpent. You see, when the serpents bit the people, here's what we got to understand is that that poison, he was giving them a, a lesson that when a snake bites those people, that poison begins to permeate their whole system. That's what sin does. Sin will permeate someone's whole life. Sin has to be eradicated out of our life. And so when he said, take that serpent, put it up on a pole, everybody that looks at it will live. Everybody that's been bitten. Now, I don't know about you, but if I've been bitten by a serpent, it ain't going to take me very long to look at that pole and somebody told me that that's what was going to heal me. But you know there's people today has got the same problem. They've been bitten by the curse of sin. And sin is destroying their lives. Man. Sin is destroying their home. It's destroying their marriages. It's destroying everything in their life. But they refuse to look to that cross, amen, where they can be healed. Amen. 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 You see, we don't have to make a cross of our own. They didn't have to go out and get their own snake and put it on the pole. Moses did that for them. All they had to do was to look and to live. And there's so many things that Jesus has done for you and I on that level, amen, that our natural mind cannot comprehend, that we can't see. And that's why Paul was telling us, he's praying that the eyes of our understanding would be enlightened, that we might be able to see what God has done for us. 
That seems like a most unusual thing, doesn't it? To just take a snake and put it on a pole. And just all you had to do was just look at it. All they had to do. When Jesus hung upon the cross for you and I, there are some things He uttered from that cross, and one of them was this. It is finished. The plan of salvation is complete. Peter said, Oh, I understand now that He was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. In other words, the cross was the accomplishment of God. <clears throat> that, that through the cross, He was able to heal every sin and sickness upon this planet to everybody that would look to Him to be saved. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Amen. Now, how many knows that the natural mind rejects that? The natural mind can't comprehend that. You just can't do it. Let me give you one more before I close. The Bible says in the book of Kings that David has grown old and he, he's ready to die. And one of his sons by the name of Adonijah decides that he wants to have the kingdom. So he gets a great following after him. He gets horses and men to run before him. And they're saying, Adonijah reigns. Adonijah reigns. Now is that just an Old Testament story? Or does it have some truth, New Testament truth, somewhere behind it? Do you realize, folks, that that's exactly what the devil was doing? He wants to be worshipped. He wants people to praise Him. He wants to rob God of all of His work. Adonijah wanted to take the kingdom. And he wanted to steal it away from his father. And the devil wants to do the same thing. And you see, we have to see with our understanding and eyes that the devil's never going to quit working. He's always going to be at work. You know why? Because he's always going to be the devil. He's never going to be good. He's always going to be the devil. And Paul was saying in the book of Ephesians that he's praying that our eyes, he's praying for the church to say, church, you need to see these things. Hello? How many, how many want to see with your spiritual understanding what God is doing Amen. in these last days? See, there's two great consummations that's running side by side. One is Jesus is going to be set up on the throne of His Father forever and ever and ever. Number two, the devil is trying to create a false religious system that many are going to be involved in in the last days. Many people are going to be involved in a false religious system called the Great Horde of the book of Revelation. He said, I saw a beast rise up out of the sea. He said, you see, the devil, every, you read it in Isaiah chapter 14. He said, I will ascend above the throne of God. I will ascend above the, uh, you, know, you know, the very throne of God and the sides of the Lord, and I will be like the Most High. He's always, that's what he's always been after, is to rob God of any worship that anybody gives him. Abel brings an offering to God. He brings, a, a, you know, one of his flock to God as an offering. What does Cain do? Cain brings an offering right behind him. But it's not has nothing to do with blood offering. It was an offering from his crops, and he thought that was going to please God. The devil is always trying to steal worship away from God. You see, we got to see that with our mind. We got to understand what the devil's up to. 
He wants to rob us. But we got to have it in our heart. We're going to move on with God. Stand with me if you would.